I'm being absolutely sincere in my praise of the film, but with the qualification that it is a beautiful art house movie. Right. We have a lot of art house movies in this country. Arguably too many. <laughs> and we'll get to the point about what I think is a glaring uh, issue with the with the story. Which actually came up last night at the, the Arrowville Q&A. But we'll get to that in a moment. Firstly, can you just tell me about Odessa Young? Absolutely. Where'd you, where'd you find her? How'd you get that performance out of her? What do you think of her? Um, we... I had some friends who had done a short film with you who were going actually almost a year beforehand saying hey are you gonna make that film uh and i said yeah it's looking like maybe but it was just really kind of in its infant days it was just like well, we kind of we found this actress who we think might be right for it and i was like i'm not even close to thinking about actresses for this yet and then we came to do a workshop and I went, well, I might as well just invite that girl that everyone's been talking to me about. Um, and Odessa came and we did the workshop and it was mostly just talking about, about how to make the film better. Um, and so I didn't really get an opportunity to see what Odessa can do when she's performing and performing in a role other than herself. So I kind of dismissed her because this is an incredibly wise and very worldly street smart person um so not the not the kind of person who would react the way that the character in the film reacts mm. because she would probably have read something by Nietzsche that would have convinced her not to do that um uh so not, really not our character so I just kind of went no I'm not going to the, um, the arc that she, that she traverses throughout the film, and especially, of course, in the final stretch, the performance, I dare say, is so strong, it's painful to watch, even third time around. And that's an incredible peak to hit. How do you extract a performance like that out of someone? Do you just do a lot of retakes and just use the best one? No, or? no. No, we did three takes of most of that stuff, um, not very, not very many, um, uh, Dessa and I, I guess what happened was, to kind of finish what I was saying about, um, having dismissed the idea of Odessa in the workshop, I then saw a glimmer of something when, when I was convinced by her agents to see her for the callback. I saw a glimmer of something where I went, oh, you're able to become someone entirely different and you're able to go to places that have nothing to do with who you actually are. A kind of, kind of the magical thing that happens with great actors. Convinced by her agent, you had to be talked into using her. I had to be talked into seeing her again at the callback, mm. yeah. Because I was like, Odessa's way too wise for this role. Way too, way too worldly. And nobody at the age of 16 can transform into someone that they're not. That's something that people do when they're Robert De Niro's age. Um, and, and then Odessa kind of went, no, I can do what Robert De Niro does, and that is I can play a character who is different to me, even though I've never gone to acting school and never learnt how to do this thing. It's just something that I know how to do. And so where do you go for a character like this? Hmm? Where do you go for where a character? Where do I go? Like, where do you go? Um, to find her. It's actually shop. really, it's a character shop. Um, it's actually really interesting because the, the way I, I've kind of developed uh, in terms of like process is just kind of the first thing I do is I think about people that I know who have same, the same kind of attributes as the character that I'm trying to play, just so I can get some kind of sense as to who, who it is. Um, but I just remember like with Hedvig I had nothing. I had absolutely nothing. There was no one that I knew who was anything like her. No access. I had no access into who she was as a character. So my process was very much about just like finding, just kind of like almost conceptualizing it through Simon. Um, and just, yeah, he, I mean, he just really made me understand where this character was coming from. And it was very much about like, 
in t like stripping back entirely my affectations um, and then coming through a completely different, um, just like completely different childhood essentially. That's really where it all kind of happened for me. It's just like how she's been brought up and, and her experiences up until scene one. Um, inevitably there are going to be a lot of comparisons uh, with this film, with European film and you know, your Bergmans and your Viscontis and all that kind of stuff. I much prefer Woody Allen because this film actually taps into a theme that Woody Allen loves and that is secrets. Mm. And Woody Allen's thesis in so many of his films is that happy life is impossible without the keeping of secrets. <laughs> and this film actually proves um, how true that is by demonstrating the opposite. Mm. Can you just tell us about what both you guys think about the importance of secrets in life? I don't know, it depends on what the rules of the relationship that you've set up are. Um, I think in some relationships the important thing is to never have secrets, no matter how brutal those secrets are, because the deal that you made with each other when you got together was we're never going to have secrets. That was Ibsen's original intention with the, the wild duck originally wasn't it? Well no, the Ibsen's intention with the wild duck is that actually there are some secrets that you should be allowed to have but that's in an environment where the need, that where um, the kind of cultural acceptance that there are certain shameful things that you've done or um, uh, where in that cultural context you kind of go well of course you can't possibly tell him um, that piece of information and I think that that's still the kind of thing nowadays, and this story does exist. I actually heard another story about this, uh, you know, very recently um, through uh, a friend of mine who had a very similar thing happen to them um, much earlier in the life of the child. So it, it created chaos without the child really being able to notice what was going on. Um, but there's always going to be some people who just kind of go, I'm too confronted by the chaos of my life right now to be able to talk about this. And then there are some people who kind of go, actually, this relationship has never been one where we've lied to each other, so we can't even start with that now. Um, and I think it's to do with what the um, what the rules are and what you kind of inherently read into the other human being how vulnerable they are and, uh, and so I think that we can't write any rules about it I think the thesis of this film is actually let's not start writing rules about when we start telling the truth and when we don't tell the truth Hey Dessa, what do you think? I have virtually no experience in any of this, so I think Simon was just able to say everything that I could have said so much better <laughs> Okay. Um, I just want to quickly ask you about this concept you have of seeing heaven, which is central <laughs> to your uh, process of adapting yeah. a, a, a play into a film. Can you just tell us briefly about seeing heaven? Because it's a lovely concept. <laughs> seeing heaven was, an, uh, was an, a concept that I invented while working on shows where I was writing new text a lot and actors were learning it and performing it before we'd really realised what in the entire piece was going to be so you kind of have to it's kind of like a film you have to lose scenes uh, and the way of kind of making the actors kind of find a way to deal with the trauma of losing a scene um, without hating me <laughs> in the process uh, for having taken it away from them is was to say it's gone to scene heaven the scene has gone to scene heaven it's an amazing scene and you'll get to play it one day in scene heaven now there is um it's a very powerful ending, this film, and it does have a great third act. The third acts continue to be an issue with Australian film in terms of delivering to the audience what they have been led to expect in the watching of the film. Mm -hmm. And I think that your film does have an issue mm -hmm. with a character mm -hmm. who gets away with way too much. Mm -hmm. And I think that as a result of that, you are denying with that character the payoff that you have built the expectation for, you kind of deny them that, and as a result I think that you, you, you may be limiting the appeal of this film by doing that. Can you just tell me a bit about oh, the obvious can. decision that you made? Um, so, you, you I don't think, yes, can, about yeah, it. I don't think we, I don't think 
we need to be as patronising about audiences to assume that they can't deal with a character getting away with having done something bad. I think, for example, the extraordinary hit, Transparent, the TV show currently on Amazon, has proved that audiences are really, really up for moral complexity and convoluted storytelling, the fantastical in balance with the, with the mundane. Mm. And I think the whole idea of the, there being a commercial formula no longer is, has now been thrown out the window. I think everyone's uh, kind of up for life being reflected honestly now mm. and not, no longer having to have the formula of a Judd Apatow film. And interestingly, Judd Apatow himself is the person who is now championing a lot of these new series like Girls, yeah, or the one yeah. that's just come out, Love, I, I get, which, I is about, which is about mundane, real life, which is where the audience isn't even thinking about act structure. I mean, who knows where the third act begins? Mm. I don't know where it begins. I guess it also comes to the issue of come up yeah. and that you know, one character is made to suffer um, you know, unfathomable depths of despair yeah. while the person responsible yeah. is untouched. And, the, and in the yeah. film you sense that, you go, this character deserves comeuppance to satisfy the expectation that we've been given in this film. And that doesn't occur. That's a brave decision to make. But again, I, th I think there was an unspoken rule, kind of essentially created by the Hayes Code, in yes. um, in Hollywood cinema, which was that criminals um, have to be punished for their actions. Um, the great revolution of the '60s cinema was that people went, "That's not how it works in the real world." Five percent of criminals actually go to jail for bank robberies for murder, for the awful things that they've done. It's not the job of cinema to create the catharsis that the audience wants. The job of cinema is to create the catharsis that they may not want but realise later was a reflection of the real world. I see in the real world constantly people suffering for other people's decisions. That's actually what the film's about. And that is that there is ultimately the only innocent becomes the victim in this film. And often the people who don't have the egotism of protecting themselves, the weapons to get out there and punish other people, to fight, are the people who end up being the victims. That's actually at the very core of what the film's about. And I genuinely believe, I don't have the pessimistic view that you do, I genuinely believe that that is something that is becoming more and more popular. Honesty, real honesty, full of actual love. Not depressing honesty, honesty which is full of the beauty of love of life and the horror at the loss of that beauty is something that people are really responding to more and more. The more that Hollywood is no longer really able to control in any kind of formulaic way like the Hayes Code uh, of the 50s, the kind of stories people are watching. And I'm loving the world that we're in where the TV shows and films are starting to tell really unconventional stories and people are lapping them up. I guess you were going to say something. Yeah, I was just going to say, going back to this whole thing about like the real essence of the film, I think that that whole idea about comeuppance and about kind of like social justice or whatever is a very, almost a biblical ideology. And I think that, like going back to the play, that's what Ibsen was trying to break away from. He was not saying that we should be making art about like people who fit into certain like story processes that we have come to expect. It was about real life art. This is a real life family. It was no longer about kings and queens and various like unrealistic people. It was a real family who experienced real things in whatever way he made that. But I think that that's what the real essence of it is, is that, you know, if we are honouring Ibsen, which we are essentially, and Ibsen was about not the typical story come up and s archetype then that's you know that it, it makes sense to me that's the logical <laughs> way to, to the way to think about it in those things actually it remains i mean as i said at the beginning it's a very powerful drama about innocence and about 
suffering mm. and about unintended consequences and about how someone who's completely blameless in every conceivable form is the one who's made to suffer the most. It's so having, it's such a moving having, performance that you put in. It's so powerful. Yeah, it is. It's amazing. Having said that, um, all of the words that you used are kind of slightly traumatic. 90, oh, well, I would say kind of, no, maybe 75% of the film is a celebration of life. Like all films where at some point that ends up in jeopardy, the majority of the investment needs to be the joy of life. And, and so it's misleading to really talk about it um, from a kind of proportional perspective. Most of the film is quite enjoyable, and that's why your reference with Woody Allen is incredibly astute. Um, uh, He's, he's kind of like, his films are kind of like a tragedy that turns into a comedy and this film is more the, a comedy that turns into a tragedy, very briefly. <laughs> Just cheekily, my life question as I walk out the room. You are known, you've been referred to as the enfant terrible of Australian <laughs> theatre. Um, but I want you to admit, on camera, in front of your wonderful young actress, that cinema is the better art form <laughs> than theatre. I know that theatre's been going for, what time is it now, a couple of thousand years, yeah. and the cinema's been going for about 120, but surely by now, when you see this film, you think, there's so much more I can do with the camera than I can do directing actors on a stage. No, I won't admit that. <laughs> Not because theatre is better than film, or film is better than theatre, but the two are such incredibly different art forms that exist in totally different dimensions. Um, I, what the, the extraordinary thing about cinema is how accessible it is. You can get it anywhere in the world. And I love living in the world where people are able to stream Tarkovsky now, living in South America, and they can watch films in remote villages that you would have had to travel to a cinema tech in the 70s in one capital city somewhere completely different to be able to watch all of these movies. Cinema is the art form that reaches everyone. It's the great democratic art form and it's the only art form that can relate to time in the way that it does. Uh, and time is the essence of the way that we see ourselves, our identity. Cinema is the most extraordinary dream art form. Theatre is the most extraordinary live art form, and I hope we never give up the live. I guess he, he did admit to me then, didn't he? Did no, he did not. <laughs>